I guess you guys keep inviting me to come over. I must be doing something right. So, uh, in fact, uh, I do uh, uh, like South Dakota a lot, and I'm not saying that because I'm here in front of you guys. I, uh, I liked it so much that about 15 years ago I even built a house in South Dakota. It's a town uh, by Yankton. So kind of uh, replaced, I grew up in Europe on the shores of Danube. Danube is one of the largest European rivers, it's like Mississippi. So, uh, so I do still have a family uh, property right on the bluffs of Danube overlooking the river. And uh, I remodeled the house there from my, uh, from my grandpa anyway. And then, uh, then I had to build another one here on this continent. So I've been one of those fortunate guys that I could go between Europe and the United States back and forth uh, and bring some students there and have projects in Europe and bring European colleagues here. So anyway, uh, so I built a house just uh, uh, outside of Yankton uh, on the lake. I don't have a water frontage there because nobody has water frontage. But uh, anyway, so I enjoyed South Dakota a lot. That's my playground, and I do a lot of hunting and fishing, so don't hold that against me. If you've got some good hunting spots or some good fishing spots, we can always talk about it. And then while we're on the boat fishing, we can talk about the Canva, we can talk about anything else you want to talk about, so. All right, uh, I do have about uh, close to 60 minutes uh, worth of uh, slides here. And uh, I'm going to start off with a couple of uh, slides giving you a general introduction about uh, what do we expect to see as far as new uh, GMO or new herbicide traits that's going to be coming over the next few years. Uh, the Canva beans, obviously, obviously they're here. And uh, last year we had about 30% of acres across, um, across the country. Uh, I did have some acres in Nebraska. I don't know how much you guys had in South Dakota here. Has anybody planted any of the Canva beans last year? Want to see some hands? Don't worry, we won't shoot you or anything like that. <laughs> anyway, okay. So there are some guys that planted, planted it here. I don't know what the number of acres is going to be this year. The predictions are that it might be a little bit higher yet. And some guys might plant it just to protect themselves uh, from, uh, from the drift. Uh, the three products that are uh, registered there are uh, Extendamax, obviously that's the one that was developed by, the, uh, by Monsanto. And then if you take the jug of Extendamax and you flip it around and you put a label of Fexapan on it, that's basically what it is. It's the same, uh, same stuff. Uh, BSF developed uh, their, own, their own version of the Canva and that's called Ingenia. I had a chance to work uh, and I'll show you a bunch of data with all of those. Uh, another technology that we're going to see on some limited acres this year is Enlist technology, Enlist beans. Uh, the two products that are going to be available on the market are Enlist Dual, which is the, the mix of uh, uh, 2,4-D choline. And by the way, 2,4-D choline is just another version of 2,4-D. We had an amine and ester versions uh, for quite a few years, and now they come up with the choline version. And the Enlist Dual will have a glyphosate 2,4-D uh, uh, premix in it. And then also there will be a 2,4-D alone, uh, and that's going to be called Enlist 1. And if you want to plant some of those beans, you have to work with the uh, company and uh, get the contract. It's not going to be widely available, available seed just to go and buy. And the reason for that is that all the yields, all the grain needs to be segregated and sold uh, through the proper channels. I guess they didn't want to have that issue we had with Starlink about 10 plus years ago. Okay, what else is in the pipeline? Uh, Bayer and Syngenta have been working on uh, HPPD tolerant soybeans. HPPD chemistries, that's the Lattice, Callisto, Balance, it's all the same mode of action. And uh, so basically, the one that's Bayer developing, uh, the product is going to be a Balance bean, and that's basically more or less the same stuff that you have inside Balance Flex. And then uh, uh, they are currently uh, 
uh, working working on that yet. I had a chance to test those in my class, and then um, I don't know what uh, what the future is going to bring. Uh, but they are talking about maybe bringing this on the market in the 20th or 20, 2020, 2021, or something like that. Uh, don't quote me on those numbers. And uh, eventually they're going to put that as a package of a, a called the Credence Technology. And basically that is going to have like a four stacks in it. It's going to be a Liberty stack, Roundup, uh, Balance Bean stack, and probably the uh, Mesotrion, which is the HPPD soybean by Syngenta. You know, Mesotrion is the active in uh, Callisto. It's been around for the last close to six, seven years. And uh, anyway, uh, Syngenta is a little bit behind uh, there on this, uh, this technology. Uh, so uh, we'll see uh, when that comes to the market. Uh, the very last line on this slide are Bolt uh, soybeans. That's the technology that Pioneer has been working on. I had a chance to test that one as well. And that will be a double stack a Roundup and or glyphosate and uh, ALS resistance. And ALS, those are the products like Pursuit, a Raptor, Scepter, those types of things. Anyway, and uh, to be honest with you, I don't know when they're gonna when they're gonna release that technology. So anyway, so that's kind of the background. That's kind of the background of what we might see. I wish I had the two slides that I can list about five different modes of actions of chemistries that we come up with, but apparently uh, we're going to wait for that for a while. All right, so the Canva. Uh, I've given this talk just in the last five weeks about seven times, so I can literally close my eyes and just go and talk, you know, so anyway. But I keep modifying it, you know, from location to location because along the way, you know, you learn by the fact people ask the questions and everything. Yeah. So the one thing that I realized uh, last summer is that a lot of people think that the Canva is somewhat similar to glyphosate, especially the way we use it. In many ways, I'm not surprised because we've been living with glyphosate for the last 20 years. I do teach an uh, integrated weed management class uh, down in Lincoln, and a lot of my students are actually the kids that come from the farms, uh, Nebraska, neighboring states, and I call them around the British generation. You know, so uh, because they grew up, and I'm not using this term in any uh, negative ways or so, uh, I'm just stating the way uh, that I see some of that stuff. Uh, those kids grew up and, uh, with around the British technology. And uh, anyway, so uh, that would be the first thing that'll come to their mind. So here, I have a few questions for you guys. Um, I'm going to test how well do you know about the Canva versus glyphosate. So question number one is there, the Canva activity. Is the Canva systemic or contact? This is some very basic stuff, guys. So uh, anyway, so how many of you think that the Canva is a uh, systemic herbicide? There's few guys there, don't be shy. How many of you think that it's a contact herbicide? Uh, somebody says both, okay. Uh, okay, which ones of you in this group here think that it's systemic? Let me see, how many hands? Okay, wow, quite a few hands. The reason why I'm asking that is that as those of you who said systemic, you will get my book free. <laughs> So anyway, I'll, uh, I'll pass a few of these around. The answer is systemic. The Canva is not a contact herbicide. Liberty is a contact herbicide. Who had hands here? It's right here. A couple of guys here. You guys uh, work on the next question. Maybe you'll get a book next time around. I brought about 20 books. Anyway, what about the Canva and uh, soil, uh, soil activity? Do we have any soil activity from the Canva? Uh, do we have some, or does it really depend on the rate? <coughs> so how many of you think that C is the correct answer? A few guys here, okay. What about from this group? How many of you think from this group that A is the answer? Okay, well maybe you guys are better educated than what I thought. 
Just kidding. Uh, the answer is C, and that's the rate, rate dependent. And I'll talk about each one of those along the way. All right, what about the mighty glyphosate? We've been using glyphosate for 20 years. Is that systemic or is that contact? Who had hand here in this group earlier? I'll give you his books. All right, there you are, sir. Uh, is glyphosate systemic or, or contact? Okay, people say contact. Uh, what about this group here? What do you guys say? Is it systemic or is it contact? <coughs> How many of you think it's systemic? Okay, we got three guys, four guys. How many of you think it's contact? Okay, you guys been using glyphosate for 20 years and you still think it's contact? It's not. Okay, so let me go back to basics. What is the difference between a contact and a systemic herbicide? As the name says, contact, it lands on the surface of the leaf and usually ends up burning the cuticle and doesn't get deep into the system. And that's what we call contact. The ones that get inside the system and translocate. What were the two hands here? There were some guys here. All right, there's one guy in the back. I'll just walk way out there and get there. Okay, so systemic is the one that will get inside the plant that move throughout the plant, move throughout the system. That's what we call it systemic. And glyphosate is a systemic herbicide, and dicamba is also systemic herbicides. And those systemics also get down into rootstock, and they uh, they control uh, 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 some of the uh, the uh, below ground uh, structures. Okay, does glyphosate have any affinity out there? None, some are rate dependent. How many of you guys in the last block there think it's a rate dependent? None. Okay, does glyphosate have any soil activity? How many of you think it's A? Yeah, it has no glyphosate uh, soil activity. You can spray glyphosate on the bare ground and the, uh, the soil particles, the organic portion of the soil particles will bind that glyphosate tightly and it doesn't release, so it's not biologically active. It's present there if we get a heavy rain and you get a runoff of that soil from your field and if I collect this, the water sample there with all that mud in it with glyphosate I'll be able to detect it so it's present there but it's not biologically uh, biologically active so okay I still have a few books left here here is the tricky one let me walk on that end now uh, we use ammonium sulfate uh, in this part of the country because of the high uh, uh, because of the, the uh, 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 water quality anyway and then uh, uh, so with the camba how much ammonium sulfate are we supposed to use? None? 2 to 4 pounds per acre or 8 to 17 uh, pounds per 100 gallons? None. How many of you think it's none? Okay. Okay, so why why you think it's none? Why we say none? Okay, because it increases volatility, yes. By adding ammonium sulfate, you can increase volatility by 20x. And I'll talk about that. I'll talk about that. Let me give them a few more books here. Uh, how many more questions? Okay, I still have a couple more questions. So the correct answer is none. The B and C are actually uh, the amounts of ammonium sulfate that you can use with Roundup. But the reason why this is going to be a hard learning curve is that we're so used to throw ammonium sulfate in the water in the tank before we start putting in glyphosate. So it'll take some, it'll some to get, it'll take some time to get used to that. What about nozzle selection? You know, with Roundup, you can just take any nozzles; it'll get the job done. You know, and uh, with dicamba, is it important? Somewhat important, or is, it, or is it critical? So, what do you guys think here? What, what is the correct answer for that question? C. C. Okay, it is extremely critical, and that's because of the drift. That's because of the drift. So, which guys want the book here? 
I got three right there. So. By the way, uh, you know, you can get these books on uh, Nebraska if you go in on a uh, UNL Marketplace. UNL Marketplace, uh, and you guys can order these. It's a 15 bucks. That's actually, you know, the price of maybe five beer, you know, so it's a very good deal. And uh, what about the canvas mode of action? Is it LS inhibition, hormonal, or is it amino acid inhibitor? <coughs> How many of you think it's LS? Okay, is it hormonal? Yes. All right, there's some guys here saying hormonal. Yeah, it is a hormonal. And the amino acid, that would be for uh, bi or, uh, glyphosate. It inhibits the shikimic acid pathways. Uh, which is important in the amino acid production. All right, so let's get the ball rolling, guys. Uh, this topic of the Canva, I'm going to start off with the uh, quote. <coughs> I think this is a tricky spot. If I stand here and I get echo. All right, the North Central Weed Science Society meeting, which is the group of weed scientists like myself, and we meet uh, uh, every year in the usually first week of December, somewhere around the North Central region, which includes about, about 12, 13 US states and about four Canadian provinces. So you put in a big room like this uh, a bunch of guys like myself, and we start arguing and talking about the topics and whatever. It's a lot of fun, I love it. I go there every year. So this is the quote uh, from one of my colleagues. Uh, that I think that, uh, very well uh, represents the current situation on the Canva. Uh, the top part is what I added. I said divide and conquer, and that can be interpreted in so many different ways. But this is what my colleague said, no other time in our recent history when greater division in opinions have ever, uh, have ever existed between, and he starts listing a few things in there, chemical companies versus university weed scientists. It seems to me that on this page, at this topic, we're not on the same page uh, with some of the uh, some of the chemical companies, uh, farmers versus chemical companies, farmers versus uh, university weed scientists, even uh, between individual farmers. So uh, anyway, so it's the topic that unfortunately divided, even went to the uh, community level where the neighbors, in some cases, don't talk to neighbors. And, uh, you know, I'm not aware of anything really bad that happened in, in this, uh, this part between Nebraska and South Dakota, but there was a case uh, last year, a couple of years ago, when the neighbor shot the neighbor down in uh, Arkansas and whatever, so it's really bad. There's a case when one company is actually suing a university from one of the states, and it's even suing a, a weed scientist that's been doing research in this topic from that particular state as well. So you can see it's turning to be uh, a little bit uh, more than, uh, than what it should be. So I'm going to quote myself. Uh, you heard what Marty said earlier, you know, I'm a straight shooter and that got me in hot water a lot, guys. I get in hot water a lot. And uh, so I'm not going to apologize for what I'm going to say. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the facts, some relatively known facts about the Canva, and then also I'm going to share with you uh, some of the research from my, uh, uh, from my work that I've done with the Canva microarrays uh, over the last, uh, over the last uh, couple, of, uh, couple of years. We actually used the really low rate of the Canva going to as low as uh, 1,000 of the label rate and uh, we were uh, evaluating the uh, sensitive crops. So, first of all, before I go further, I want to spend quite a bit more time on the, the Canva itself. Like I said earlier, we are so used to glyphosate and the Canva is not glyphosate. If you look at Nebraska Weed Guide, I have about 750 products in there that are registered in the state of Nebraska. Out of that, about 260 for corn, 250 for beans, 200 plus for cereal crops, and then the rest are all rangeland pasture and some other uh, uh, smaller acre crops. So. Uh, you know, we do have probably 60 plus products based on Roundup. Uh, the two that are based on the Canva 4 
uh, the Camba beans are extended mass and Gini and, uh, and of course Fexapan. So those are the only three. Don't even think about trying to use Clarity or something like that because you're going to violate the label for that. And theoretically speaking, your crop can be confiscated. I said that's theoretically speaking. Uh, so. Uh, Mode of action, it's a hormonal, I'll talk quite a bit about what that means, uh, versus glyphosate is amino acid inhibition. Glyphosate is a fantastic herbicide. I don't think that we will ever come up with a better chemical, not maybe in my lifetime. Even with all the uh, 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 computer sciences and uh, computer engineering, uh, chemi chemical engineering and everything, you know, it's, it's getting trickier and trickier to come up with the new, new active ingredients. So, uh, uh, glyphosate, like I said, it's a fantastic herbicide. It's, it's a very good uh, 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 a grass killer. And then along the way, it does an excellent job on a lot of broadleaf weeds. And it's been doing that for the last 20 years. And it's still doing an excellent pork out there unless you have a glyphosate resistant weed. As opposed to the camba, the camba has been used in cereal crops for uh, uh, several decades and in rangeland and pasture, so it has uh, almost no uh, no grass activities. It's a broadleaf killer. Uh, visible injury: you spray the camba, and you'll get cupping uh, literally within a couple of days. Uh, for glyphosate, you will need about four or five days. Uh, temperature: uh, this part of the country and. Uh, I do a lot of research, about 60 miles crow flies south of Yankton. You know, uh, this, this part of the world, we may have some nice uh, warm spills uh, early in the spring, and then you get geared up, you want to go out and spray some round to, to kill some of those winter annuals, and then uh, next day, the clouds may move in, whatever, and the temperature may drop down in the 40s, and all of a sudden you see the glyphosate's not working, and in some of those cases, if the period stays uh, four or five days uh, in the 40s, uh, that Roundup and Roundup ain't going to get the job done. So anyway, so from that standpoint, Roundup is, uh, is, is very sensitive to temperature, and that's not really the case for the Canva. Uh, volatility, uh, it's high and off-target movement, therefore it's high, and I'll talk quite a bit of volatility. Ammonium sulfate, we said that don't use it. The rain fast. Uh, for uh, glyphosate, especially some of the latest version of glyphosate, is even less than an hour. In the, in the book, I have it as a one hour. And uh, for the camera, it's about four to six hours. If you read the label, the label will say, don't use uh, uh, the camera if you expect a rainfall within 24 hours. So that's the question that I ask quite a bit in different places. And eventually, uh, I got the answer that says something along the lines that EPA is the one that put that line on the label, or it required the company to put that line on the label because uh, apparently the computer system that they have to simulate all these different rain events at the EPA level can handle only a 24-hour time, uh, time frame. So that's why that sits on the label. Uh, and I'll tell you, I'm not going to tell you to violate the label, but I can tell you you can maybe twist this a little bit and I'll give you some of the logic, logic behind that. So remember this number, four to six hours is rain fast, which means you spray the chemical and it should be absorbed uh, a good portion of it you know, into the weed uh, within the four to six hours. So if you get rainfall after that, you shouldn't be worried. So. Okay, sensitive crops, a grassy species for glyphosate, uh, especially, and we still remember the old days when we started with Roundup Ready Beans and there was conventional corn and the stiff stuff would drift over a little bit and maybe a, a, a burnt few, a few rows of corn and so, uh, you know, so with glyphosate, you've got to watch for those grassy, grassy species. Uh, the camba being a broadleaf killer uh, basically has effects on all kinds of broadleaf crops and I'll share with you information unknown. DT soybeans, and then also on uh, tomatoes and grapes that I grew in my, in my plots. Weed resistance, we do have 36 species worldwide that develop resistance to glyphosate, 16 species in, in the United States, and I think I have six species in Nebraska that we, uh, we determined through our, 
research. Right now, there's about seven different weed species that develop resistance to glyphosate, to uh, Kush, to uh, uh, Dicamba, and the one that you should be familiar with is Kosha, especially if you go to the western part of your state and my state and uh, western part of Kansas, eastern part of Wyoming and Colorado, there is quite a bit of uh, uh, the camber resistant kosher out there. In terms of following the label, uh, it's very important uh, to know what the weed height is. You know, like I said earlier, glyphosate is a fantastic herbicide and if the weed is a little bit taller, as long as it's not glyphosate resistant, the glyphosate will get the job done, Roundup will get the job done. That's not the case with the camber. If the weeds have some height, uh, it's not going to get the job done. I'll show you some pictures of that. The rate is very critical, uh, and if you keep jacking up the rates, like we do with glyphosate, uh, then you may have issues with the, uh, with the volatility and drift and so forth. Uh, that's not really uh, uh, that critical with glyphosate. Sprayer calibration is always important, no matter what we spray out there, you know, but this becomes really critical. Uh, with uh, the camba, especially cleaning the sprayer, if you want to be using for the camba, then you go for the other uh, herbicides and other crops, whatever. Uh, that cleaning can be a pretty tricky task. In fact, uh, uh, a group of us in Nebraska are actually developing a story that's going to be published on the uh, UNL website. And we have a, um, a crop watch uh, newsletter. I don't know if some of you. Uh, uh, subscribe to that or not, but if you type in crop watch a UNL, you get to our website and that's where we publish that's where we publish a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, information on, on certain stuff in agriculture and in fact the uh, the uh, two page write up that I sent to uh, Ruth a couple of weeks ago this was actually published on that website there so anyway and uh, so we'll have some uh, um, a recommendation for sprayer uh, uh, cleaning. Applicator training, uh, it's a restricted use product to these three, so you need to be trained. Uh, uh, it's required by law, that's not required by glyphosate. Label, I'm going to say something that some of you will relate to it, some of you may not like it, but really, over the last 12 years, 20 years, we've been using glyphosate so much, a lot of people there don't even know what label is for glyphosate quite frankly. And it's easy to use, you know, you know, you can put in 20 ounces or 30 ounces or 40 ounces. Some guys are using 50 even ounces if it's generic and all that, if you have some hardness to control weeds. So like I said, label uh, always should be read and followed, but it was not much of a big issue with glyphosate. Apparently it's very important. It's very important to understand for the camera and that includes the nozzle selection. So I guess with this, I'm, I'm trying to drive a message across that the stuff that we you used to with glyphosate, uh, to do with glyphosate, and then uh, get away with it and everything, it's a completely different uh, ball game, guys, with the camera. So we gotta watch how we use that. Okay, so let's talk about how does that the camera work. I said earlier, it's a formula of chemistry. Hormones. As the word says, they boost growth of something. You know, we use hormones uh, in the animal feed, we use hormones with humans. My wife is actually a hormone doctor, you know, so she works with hormones. Uh, she even works with transgenic people. She can literally turn a man into a woman, a woman into a man. So I'm, I'm really nice with my wife, you know. <laughs> so anyway, but what I'm trying to say, this is how hormones work, you know, they boost. Uh, they boost uh, uh, activity, so when they get inside the plant, they basically boost the growth of the plant, and since they're systemic, they go through the system, through the phloem, and they travel into the tips of the leaves, because that's where the uh, youngest uh, tissue is, or the, the tip of the growing point, and uh, what's happening in there, they're boosting the growth of those young cells, because the young cells, as they grow, they require more food than the old cells, so those new young cells as they are growing and taking up the food, they're taking up uh, uh, the camba with it, and then they grow on an accelerated rate, so therefore they end up curling and twisting because uh, they grow faster than the rest of the cells in the plant. And then as a result of that, the plant, the leaves, and the stems, I'll show you a lot of photos 
they start curling and twisting. They start curling and twisting, and then as part of that, we call that term epinasty. It's a, a, one of those scientific journals, uh, jargons that we use in weed science. And then as part of that process, that curling and twisting, you get the blockage of the vascular system. The food cannot travel throughout the plant, and therefore the plants will, will starve. Uh, it can be absorbed both by the roots and by the shoots. I hope that we're going to use the camera primarily post-emerge, uh, but if you have high enough rate, you can actually get residual activity of about maybe a couple of weeks, depending on the, uh, depending on the, uh, uh, on the rate and the, uh, uh, the soils and all that. So speaking of soils and soil persistence, the camera can uh, can be detected in the soil. If it's dry soil, it can be there for a few months. If it's wet soil, uh, it can be there a few weeks, you know, because the microbes will be degrading it and also it will volatilize it and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, head off. And that way you can, you can see a breakdown. So from that standpoint, like I said, it's a short residual, but I would not recommend this uh, to be used as a soil, soil applied uh, herbicide. So anyway, does it persist in air? Yes, that's the topic of, uh, of volatility. And volatility is the heaviest in the first 24 to 36 hours. However, it's been documented in the literature that it can be detected basically up to 96 hours or up to four days. So when you think about it, today is Thursday, so if I spray it today, so we have a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday morning, theoretically, that can still lift off the soil and volatilize and, and cause some problems along the way. But like I said, it's less likely for that to happen. Uh, uh, the, the most critical will be the first uh, 36 hours. And I'll show you some data to, to show that. So, all right, so here is the deal. This is a single slide that has a lot of information on it, but I already went through most of that, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But this is what I call the 10 things that somebody needs to know about the Canva, even before you start thinking about buying uh, that product and using it. So I said it's a broadleaf killer, so you got to watch what your neighbors are. If your farm has an acreage with a lot of grapes, and or the grandma has a lot of tomatoes or something, you may not want to watch out because that grandma ain't going to be happy. So anyway, and uh, mode of action, I said it's a hormonal, uh, it's a restricted use, we covered that. You have to understand the label, don't use ammonium sulfate uh, because it increases volatility by 20x. Let me give you a little more information on this. The, uh, the, this DMA, DMA form of the Canva, when it reacts with ammonium sulfate, that ammonia makes that the camba a little bit more as acidic, which makes it more prone to volatility. So that's the reason why they say do not use ammonium sulfate with the camba because you're increasing the chance for volatility. Okay, application cutoff dates. This is something that when some of the state departments of ag I was actually told earlier that there might be some people here from uh, South Dakota State Department of Ag. Is anybody in the room here from the Department of Ag? Yes or no? Apparently not. Oh, yes, there is some. Okay, cool. Uh, what, I, uh, what I was told that Arkansas has a cutoff date of 4-15. That's wrong on my slide. It's April 15. Uh, uh, Missouri is June 1 and June 15. Depends on what part of Missouri. Uh, down in the Booth Hill area is, I think it's June, uh, June 1. Okay, I was told that North Dakota has uh, June 15 uh, in Minnesota, and somebody told me that South Dakota has that. So the reason why I ask is anybody, I don't know if my information is correct or not, or whether you guys are still considering a uh, cutoff date, or... No, there's no cutoff date. There is no cutoff date. Okay, thank you. So that means I gotta, I gotta fix my slide there, too. So you guys are basically on the same boat like Nebraska. Nebraska right now doesn't have any cutoff, cutoff date. Okay, volatility, uh, I told you uh, how that can be detected for 96 hours. There was quite a bit of papers presented, presented at the North Central meeting uh, this year, and that's where that information comes from. But number 10 is the one that actually I want to visit with you. This is something that I got a lot of hair about it. And uh, a 
I'll show you some data uh, later on. Uh, and the data is showing that if you get a rainfall event, that volatility, and let me talk about volatility, uh, basically, uh, you know, you'll spray the camera and it will settle down, hopefully, and if you get a temperature inversion, uh, you know, the mix of air going in, and there's a chance for that volatility, that cloud, let's call it cloud, it's not a very scientific term, but I'm trying to explain this, so this cloud, the volatile cloud, can lift off the field and move, depends on what direction the, the, the airstream comes through. And it's been known for that to move, you know, a couple of miles in some cases. Some people claim four miles, I haven't seen it myself, but, you know, but let's stick with a couple of miles. Okay, so just think about this situation. You spray the camera and you wait for six hours, eight hours, and then if, if there's a chance for temperature inversion and the cloud can lift, if you have an irrigation system, which we do in Nebraska quite a bit, can you just turn your sprinkler system on and irrigate very, very lightly, about a fifth of an inch, 0.2 inches uh, uh, of rain, and just keep going with that circle or lateral, whatever you have, and the camba is extremely water soluble. It moves with, dissolves in water, it moves with water real well, so it's extremely water soluble. So, I said in here, this, what I'm just describing, is my theory, it needs some research there, but we already have some proof that actually there might be some value in it, and I have some of my Nebraska guys who are going to actually try this, you know, uh, to turn the sprinkler, uh, like I said, a fifth of an inch, and that should be enough to break up that cloud and kind of settle things, and uh, you can get actually a secondary or tertiary uh, uh, volatilities uh, as over those next three or four days, but the most critical one is the first first one, and that's the one that usually causes trouble by moving off. Okay, so uh, that's kind of the, uh, the the point that I was going to make uh, with that potential uh, potential irrigation. I said earlier that the camera is not glyphosate, and uh, here's the photos from some of my research uh, from last year. These are the, uh, the label rates of, uh, of products uh, that we use. Uh, it's either Ingenia or Fexicon, it was one or the other, or maybe both. I have about four photos here. And these are the weed species that were a little bit taller, a little bit taller than, than where it's supposed to be. And you can see that we curled and twisted. These are uh, glyphosate resistant uh, Mary's tail here. We curled it and twisted, but we did not kill it. You can see the same in this photo with the uh, a walnut leaf. We got all the cupping and everything, but we didn't we didn't kill it. So anyway, so it's very important to know the weed height, and especially if you're in a drought, like we've been last summer in the drought situation, we had plenty of rain in the beginning and then shut off for two months, and then we got rain in the fall, which messed up our harvest and everything. You guys can relate to all that. Anyway, so if, if the plants are stressed and everything, they're not going to take that chemical well, and it's a possibility that some of those weeds are not going to die. I do have quite a few of my students, former students that actually work for industry, so I called them and I said, hey, come on over. So we looked at some of these plants, I pulled them out, the roots are still good and everything, so these uh, plants did not, did not die. And there's this uh, water hemp, you can see how the main stem here, and the leaves are all twisted and wrapped and everything, but there was no there was no uh, 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 complete control. In fact, you can see the branch here continue to grow on the side, and that just kept uh, kept growing. So. Okay, so now when you think about that, you did all the training, um, you think you're ready to go and spray. Uh, the one thing that can throw a monkey wrench in your plants is the thing that we can always count uh, here in this part of the country is the wind. You know, and well that. I have several slides here that picked up a couple locations. I'll ask my technician to give me uh, some numbers here. So this is the average wind speed Concord. This is just about a 60 mile profile south of uh, Yankton, north of Wayne, Nebraska. If you guys maybe know Wayne, but I don't know Concord. It's just a small town uh, where the university has a station. So you can see in the months of May, months of June, we had about 15 days, 20 days that their wind speed from 3 to 10 miles an hour. 
So last year they modified the label, so the label for this year says uh, don't spray when it's less than 3 miles, spray when it's 3 to 10, and don't spray when it's more than 10 miles an hour. The reason why they say don't spray uh, uh, wind speeds less than 3 miles an hour, which is actually really a counterintuitive, because you would expect that you want to go out and spray your chemicals on those nice calm days. Uh, actually, those calm days, our weatherman tells us, are those where there is a chance for that uh, temperature inversion, which can, uh, you know, induce uh, uh, some of that volatility. So basically, you could see that you could use about maybe this uh, every other day, uh, you know, so you may get ready to go, and then uh, you'll have to watch that wind speed. Uh, this is Ainsworth, about 19 days and 23 in May and June. I hope those are the two months we'll be used this. I hope we don't go into July. And then a central city, similar story, and then New York, you know, I should, they didn't have as many windy days in, uh, in uh, May. Again, that wind speed and direction is very, very important. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to walk you through some of the research that my colleague uh, Tom Mueller has done on the volatility. They sprayed um, uh, all three products out there, and then they did a air sampling, and they've done all their sampling from 0 to 6 hours after 6 to 12, 12, 24, and 24 to 30 C out after spraying. So basically, uh, this is what some of the equipment looks like. You know, after they sprayed, uh, they went in and set up this uh, little aspirator that will, uh, you know, uh, absorb the uh, air, put it in a filter paper, and they bring the paper in and run it through this equipment. Temperature out there was in the about, uh, about uh, day, day time, uh, was about 90s. This was all done at uh, Tennessee. And then uh, basically what they're showing here, this is the amount of volatility uh, in uh, nanograms. Uh, that's a 10 of minus uh, 12 uh, per hour, which that doesn't really matter. Basically, we just got to uh, uh, watch here is the length of these bars. So you can see the amount here from 0 to 6 hours, from 6 to 12. And then they had a rainfall event that occurred on 12 hours. And you can see how that volatility dropped way down. And that's where I got that idea. In fact, I talked to Tom, he's my good colleague, and he's going to be repeating this work uh, again. And he said, yeah, that would help if you try to irrigate, you know. Uh, uh, because that's what this data is showing. So he did this with the green plants, with dead plants, which is the residue on the soil, and just the, the filled soil. And then basically, uh, that's what uh, this is with extended max. So you can see uh, the volatility is much higher of the green plants than the dead plants and the filled soil. Also, he did this uh, comparing two different products here uh, against Clarity. So he's in Gini, extended max, and Clarity. And uh, you can see the amount of volatility, especially in those first 12 hours from Clarity and Extended Max and Ingenia were actually half as volatile. So this vapor drift technology does help uh, with volatility if you compare it to Clarity. And uh, if Tom did this work with Banwell, which is the older version of the Canva, these bars will be twice as long than what they're for Clarity. So as you can see, they keep coming up with these better versions of the Canva from the volatility standpoint, uh, but still the volatility is there and it, uh, you know, it, can be, uh, it can be an issue. And that's what this, uh, this slide is showing. Okay, so they also added some Roundup to it because there were some talks about uh, if you put Roundup, is that going to make it vol more volatile? And apparently not, but the deal is here that they have not used any ammonium sulfate in any of these studies. So he basically uh, concluded that, yeah, the, the, the camera is there and can be detected. That's what these four, uh, first four lines are saying. But the last two lines is actually uh, uh, some very important uh, a point that I'm trying to drive across. And he, uh, he said it himself that all of his research was done in, uh, on a small plot acres. So he said the result of the collecting the volatility and the samples, you know, is on a small scale research plots, but he said it might be a whole different goal game when we start spraying, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres with, with the Canva. So, all right, so I guess what I'm going to do now in the last 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about my research with the Canva that we've done over the last two years. This was funded by Nebraska Soybean Board. 
because uh, they're trying to come up with uh, 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 regulations on the use of this in Nebraska. So they wanted to see are these injuries real and what kind of yield losses we can have and everything. So basically I compare the, the three products, Clarity, Extendamax, and Ingenia. We use five micro rates. Uh, I call them micro rates because they're much lower than the label rate. Uh, going from 110, 150, 100, 1500, and 1000 of the label rate. So in order to uh, illustrate this, I had to uh, steal some uh, teaspoons and tablespoons from kitchen. My wife was asking, what are you going to do with those? I said, honey, this is called infective extension. This is what people can relate to it. So, one ten of the label rate is equivalent of three tablespoons, three tablespoons of the camba over uh, one acre, and one acre is a football field. So just keep that in the back in your mind. Uh, when I say three tablespoons over an acre, this is like this much the camba if you spray it across a football field. One hundred of the label rate is equivalent of a one teaspoon. One teaspoon. A colleague of mine, Bob Klein, who does a lot of pesticide application technology work in Nebraska, I didn't want to steal his thunder. He watched, I could have used one of his slides. He said, if you take a pipette and you have a one drop of the camba, if you put one drop of the camba in the water solution and you spray 2.7 acres of Roundup Ready Liver Tilling conventional or organic beans, they will cut. So one drop over at 2.7 acres can cause cupping of the beans. It doesn't mean that you're going to have yield reduction. No, you're not going to have yield reduction. But we're just talking about how sensitive are, uh, are those, uh, those beans to, uh, to the canvas. So we use three application times. I sprayed on the V2 second trifoliate stage, which is the time where we will hopefully use this product and then a beginning flower stage and a full flower. The reason why I went with this, and this is off the label because the label says up to flowering, so you're not going to spray at the flowering stage. Uh, and, um, so anyway, the reason why I did it is that the, uh, we may have neighbors that are going to plant at different times. You, if you plant today and your neighbor plants two or three weeks later, you know, it takes about four or five days for those beans to develop a leaf. So uh, your beans might be flowering or close to flowering stage by the time he goes out to spray his V3 or V2 beans. So we use the Canva beans, we use Roundup Ready Liver Tilling conventional, we use grapes and tomatoes. So my results are showing that all three products equally affected soybean growth and development. I'm not going to say this is good product, this is bad product. No, all three uh, caused equal level of injury to non-DT soybeans. And all three soybean types were equally sensitive. I had people ask me uh, when I gave this box uh, last year, oh, are the round of pretty liver to link maybe a little bit more tolerant than conventional? And I said, no, they're not. They're all equally sensitive to the camp. So now I'm going to walk you through about maybe uh, 20 or so slides where you're going to see a lot of photos. But these are the growth parameters that we measured, and you'll see photo of each one of those. So there was reduction in plant height up to three feet in some cases. There was alteration in the branching pattern. Uh, you kill the growing point of the beans and you get more uh, branches developing. So we see some of that. There's quite a bit of canopy closure delay up to 21 days, uh, delayed flowering up to 10 days when we have sp sprayed on that V2 stage and then reduction in flower numbers up to 92%. So if you have a, a flower number reduction by 92%, so you probably have a 90% yield reduction too. And I'll show you that data. Uh, delayed maturity, anywhere from five to 25 days, a lot of visual injuries there, and reduction in soybean height. And of all these three growth stages that we uh, sprayed, the beginning flower stage was the most sensitive. So basically, uh, these are some shots now that show cupping of the leaves versus normal, normal leaves. Uh, what you see here is that, that cupping that I was telling you about, that's where all that new uh, young growth is occurring and that's where the hormones are kind of uh, rushing in and, and uh, you can see uh, the effects there first. 
this is the leaf cutting uh, uh, and stem curling versus uh, top, top of the stem twisting when we spray the V2 stage versus V7 versus R2. You can see uh, the stems here, how they're uh, uh, twisted. And this was with Ingenia one-tenth of the, of the label rate. Uh, this is what I said earlier, uh, you know, the, the Canva uh, will kill the growing point of non-DT soybeans if the rate is high enough, and then basically you'll get the stunting of the plant for a while, and then they're going to start developing branches because the growing point is killed, which means the main stem of the plant is shut down, which is basically shown in this slide. This is a 110, 100 uh, of the label rate where we see branching. Uh, that's the good news. You know, the beans are resilient. Uh, they, uh, they'll produce branches and those branches will produce some yields. You know, but we're not going to have a main stem uh, where we may have like a three or four pods on each of the, of the, uh, the nodes there at the main stem. Uh, there's some uh, reduction in height uh, with the 8 inches through this 32 inches in untreated. And then uh, Another one with heights with the 110, 100, and 1,000 of the label rate, and 1,000 of the label rate uh, as well. And then uh, here's the shots uh, where you can really see uh, uh, this was application on that uh, end of the flowering stage. And you can see where that stem bent there and everything. We actually, in the weed science, have a discipline or sub sub discipline that's called a forensic weed science where you can basically, by looking at the symptoms and everything, you can actually determine when did the drift occur and the uh, destruction, destruction of the plant growth occurred. Uh, so you have also pods that may have only one or two seeds and actually that's pretty uh, uh, visible from this photo that shows a single, uh, single seed uh, and pod. Okay, and a couple more shots of delayed maturity. Uh, these are the spray. Uh, and, and non, uh, non spray, you see how they drop the leaves and they're going to start drying, hopefully, and everything. And these guys are still, uh, still green, and this shot is showing, uh, showing as well. So, okay, so like look some numbers one tenth of the label rate, which is equivalent of about three tablespoons. Uh, we have DP beans, round the pretty, liver filling, and conventional, and those are the three products, the three application times. And you, I can just show you there uh, 60 to 70 percent visual injury with the one tenth of the label rate, which is pretty high rate. I don't see that that will be the rate for volatility, but this could be a rate for the particle drift, for the particle drift that drifted over from the neighbor. Uh, you know, in a 150 of the label rate, we're still in the 60s and 70s. And I'm not going to spend too much time on these numbers because they all pretty much tell the same story. If you go to a 100 of the label rate, that will be that one teaspoon rate. You can see that one teaspoon, you can still get a 60% uh, 60 uh, visual injury. And then one 500 of the label rate, we're down in the 50s. As you can see, as you dilute the rate more, uh, you get less uh, injury. Uh, but you can still see quite a bit of that visual. And you can see even with 1,000 of the label rate, we're down in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And next year I'm actually repeating this study and I'm going to have a 1 10,000 on the label rate and I may even push it up to 1 15,000 on the label rate. All right, so let's talk about yields. That's where the rubber meets the road. So the V2, this is extend the max. Application V2 uh, in round the pretty beans. One tenth of the label rate, 150, 100, 500, and 1,000 of the label rate. You guys can see this on both on both screens. So, in the uh, uh, V2 application, we have 63 bushels and non spray. The number in the bracket three is a standard arrow. That means plus minus how much variation you will have there variability. So, uh, so 63 uh, plus minus three because we. Do this in a, in a four replicated trial, so that's kind of the standard error of that number. So when uh, when the one tenth of the label rate, so the yield dropped down to 33, we went 115 to 48, 51, 58, and then 57. So with the one thousandth of the label rate, uh, the yield was 57 bushels plus minus two. When you look at the uh, uh, second application window. 
The one-tenth of the label rate, the yield dropped from 65 down to 6 bushels. And then 150 was 32, 45, 53, and then 57 bushel. 57 bushel was uh, with uh, the uh, uh, seven uh, the one thousandth of the label rate. And then here on R2, where we're getting 65 versus 61. I know there's a lot of numbers here, and I maybe go a little bit faster, but at least uh, this is kind of a snapshot, and we're going to repeat this next year again. All right, so that's around the pretty. Uh, with uh, 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 extend the max. Now with Ingenia, same layout, you can see 60 bushels versus 56 with 1,000. Uh, the V764 versus 52 uh, bushels with the, uh, so you can see there like almost 10 bushel even with 1,000 of the label rate, which is pretty excessively, I didn't expect that there. Uh, and then with the uh, R2, 64 to 59. And then when we look at uh, Clarity, uh, same 63, actually here it stayed 63, and uh, uh, V7 is 63 versus 55, and 62 versus 63. Uh, so anyway, this may look like it actually gained a bushel, but actually I didn't put the standards there, arrow there, we're still uh, analyzing data, and it makes the slides pretty uh, pretty busy. The bottom line is that, you know, it's a very similar trend, in fact, when you look across all three, and I think this is the slide that you guys may have in your handouts, so you can see uh, a very similar, very similar level of, uh, of uh, yields across all this. And then in Liberty Link beans, a very similar story, and then with the conventional beans, again, a very similar story. Like I said, a lot of numbers and uh, so I don't want to dwell, uh, dwell on each and every one of these lines too much. The bottom line is that yes, all these uh, uh, titrations that we use, all these sub-rates can cause uh, yield, uh, yield loss. So this work was done also in tomatoes and grapes. This required quite a bit of babysitting because we plant these in pots and we had to do a lot of watering. The picture here on the top shows beans with that kill growing point there, you know, that was like a uh, literally about uh, a couple weeks after spraying and the plant looks sick uh, for a while and eventually they develop branches and they keep going as i shown in some of the previous photos. Looking at the tomato, you can see uh, uh, this what we call a canker-like uh, callus uh, uh, because of the growth uh, of this and then there's the uh, uh, grapes that we uh, fortunately killed. Uh, looking at all three different products for grapes, about the same level of injury, as much as about 60%, uh, 60 across, uh, uh, regardless of the type of injury or the type of uh, product. You can see the one-tenth of the label rate uh, killed these. These were uh, two-year-old bare root uh, seedlings that we bought in bunch. I think I bought over a thousand, thousand seedlings uh, because we were doing all the different rates and everything, and then we had five plants for each for each plot. So uh, anyway, so the one-tenth of the label rate uh, killed those uh, two-year-old uh, seedlings and then the one-hundreds and one-five-hundreds of the label rate, there's some injuries there, some injuries there, all the other ones didn't have uh, as much injury. And then uh, there's the shot of the one-hundred and one-tenth of the label rate. And uh, there's no fruits here obviously because they're too young to produce any fruits. Uh, tomato, we had more injury up to about 80 percent, and but there was no difference between the three three products that were equally uh, uh, detrimental to this. Uh, and uh, you can see the non-spray tomatoes even has some fruits there, and these are the one tenth and one hundredth of the label rate. Uh, you know that were pretty stunted, uh, and no flowers production whatsoever. So I just have two more slides, and I'm pretty much done. So the bottom line is that yes, the non the camba tolerant beans are sensitive, and then uh, you know we need to watch how we use it uh, and uh, what we do with it. So there was also a question I've been asked. So I added this slide, a couple of slides here, uh, just in the last few times. Uh, there is, and I would say mostly anecdotal stories out there that if you have. A drift of that Dacamba on your uh, Round the Pretty Liberty Organic. And I do have quite a few organic guys, and I know you guys have organic people here in, in South Dakota. 
that complain about this rift, and there's people out there saying, oh, come on, you know, you may actually get a boost in the yield, you know, not really a drop in the yield. So a colleague of mine, Andrew Kness, he's from Wyoming, he's a younger guy, uh, he likes uh, statistics and number crunching and all that. So uh, basically he did a meta-analysis, and this is uh, presented literally just about uh, two weeks ago at the National Weed Science Society meeting. And uh, he combined the data from 12 dose response studies that were conducted between 2000 and 2016, which is basically the graph here showing, here's the, uh, this is the, the, the uh, research that was published in the weed science literature uh, by different uh, scientists. There's some guy that did it as early as 69. There's some people from 2016, 14, 13. There is even my study from 17. I sent in my data and uh, from the, uh, some of the other years. Anyway, so uh, I was happy to see that my yields, uh, and this is the Canva, uh, those that will uh, cause 2.5% yield loss. So I can see that my numbers are right in the line where some of the other colleagues did it, but obviously those colleagues did the work uh, in, from previous years primarily with Clarity or Bamble, uh, they didn't have Extendamax and, uh, and Genia. So my numbers are right there, right there uh, in the line of the others. And then basically uh, he concluded that there was no evidence of increased soybean yields from those low, uh, low levels of, uh, of the camp exposure. So that's why I'm going to be uh, you know, adding some more lower rates in my, uh, in my research next year. So this is my very last slide. I don't know what, uh, what the future is going to bring. Uh, and, uh, okay, the one thing I want to say for sure first is that this labels of uh, the Canva and Gene Fexapan expire this year. So at the end of this year, uh, the EPA needs to decide whether they're going to let them relabel re this or come up with a new label. So nobody knows what's going to be, whether there's going to be more training, more government regulations, whatever might be out there. So I don't know what the future is going to bring from that. I heard some rumors that EPA is saying, oh, if this year we have a lot of problems and drift and complaints, we may not even allow a labeling of this, which uh, my gut feeling is that that's probably not going to happen. But again, uh, those are just my speculations. Speculations, and you can take it uh, uh, however you want, but you know nobody knows what's really going to happen uh, next year. Uh, what are some of my future plans? Basically, I plan on repeating this work uh, with uh, adding more micro rates, and then also I'm going to initiate uh, another two years of study, two years of studies with endless technology with 2,4D technology. 2,4D is kind of a younger brother, or however you want to call it, uh, a brother of the Canva, and it's not volatile, nearly as volatile as the Canva. You know, but there might be still issues with the particle drift. So I'm going to initiate the, the whole uh, uh, work uh, with uh, with uh, Enlist One uh, this year, and then uh, hopefully uh, next year as well. So anyway, and uh, with that, I'm going to stop, Marty. And if you guys have any any questions, I guess I I think I did it in about an hour and three minutes or something like that. Great, there you are. Thank you. That's all I have, guys. <laughs>